Aloha. It's April the 6th, 2022. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's time for What Now America. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's title of the show is City of Bucha, Visuals of War Crime. The title of this program is called What Now America. And that title could well be a question. What do we do? What now America? What do we do about what we just saw this weekend as far as all the the pictures and the video, the video stream of the city of Bucha as Russia has vac evacuated it and has retreated and has left a stream and, and a river of war crimes in the streets of Bucha. Bucha. So to uh, discuss that today is my guests, Jay Fidel and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Jay, before I ask you the first question, I unfortunately I have to run down what we all saw this weekend, be it on CNN or whatever news station, BBC, and the uh, the images were undeniable. Uh, we saw the dead lane in the streets. We saw people shot off their bicycles. We saw people who had plastic bags of uh, potatoes or food items uh, trying to get home and feed uh, their family shot in the streets. We saw people with our hands bound behind them, dead. We saw cars with people in them, crushed by tanks. Zelensky, President Zelensky said that people's tongues were pulled out. There was rape, there was wholesale slaughter. And that's just the beginning of what we saw in Bucha. I suppose the question to you, Jay, is, this probably is not unlike what we saw in Grozny, Chechnya, or Aleppo, Syria. What makes the difference between what we're seeing now in Ukraine versus those other two campaigns of terror and war crimes that Putin committed on those two separate countries? Uh, the pictures, the press, the fact that they're going around the world on every media you can imagine, that makes the difference. But, you know, the, the brutality was the same. As a matter of fact, you know, I keep thinking, I wonder if you guys agree, I keep thinking, how is this different from the Holocaust? I mean, these are innocent people. In the Holocaust, they were looking for certain groups of people like the Jews. In this case, it's like everybody, everybody in the country. Shoot them in the eye, pull out their tongue, you know, destroy them. And, and so far, it's been 5,000. And it'll be much more. It may be more already. What's the difference? I mean, they're they're doing genocide. They're doing countryside. <laughs> Everybody in the country is at risk. Um, so anyway, the only difference here is that we, you know, the world is getting it. And, and there's two sides to that. One is that it certainly would motivate the world to do something, Western Europe and the US, even China, United Nations. Um, but at the same time, it also, it's shocking to find that these countries aren't doing enough to stop it because it continues to go on. You'd think that genocide in plain view on the screen right in front of you for hours every day would be enough, you know, to motivate the kind of action that the world needs to take to stop it. But it continues. That's what blows my mind. It's like a bad movie and it won't stop. I, I don't know what's wrong here, but humanity is failing the test. The Western you know, European countries are failing the test. I don't care what they say about sanctions. I don't care about all the speeches and the name calling. It continues. How could this happen? You know, I, I've talked to some folks and, and I get the same response over and over again. I can't watch anymore. I can't take it. It's too much. It's overwhelming. I have to watch alternative programs. I have to watch cartoons. Uh, that's some of the responses I've gotten to what we what we all witnessed this weekend. And and what does that say about human nature? Is that it's it can only tolerate so much carnage and and, and brutality before the mind just says I can't I can't uh, comprehend it any further and I can't process it. How do we respond to the, the possibility of people becoming desensitized and nothing more gets done? I don't know. They are being desensitized. You know, Putin is a very smart guy. 
And he set up that nuclear threat early on and the threat of biochemical weapons early on, and he scared everybody. He terrified, you know, Western Europe, and he terrified uh, the U.S. And, of course, the U.S. has its own uh, problems. But, you know, the right move would be, I'm sorry, this is not just a, a, an attack on Ukraine and the individual human beings in Ukraine. It's an attack on everything, an attack on, on moral society everywhere. Um, and we have forgotten about that. And we are in the throes of forgetting a lot about it. You know, never again is happening again. You know, I tell you the truth. At, at first, there was all this discussion about, oh, no, we can't take a risk of nuclear war. Oh, no, we can't take a risk that he's going to get mad. Um, I, I want to tell you a short story, and, and then I'll stop. In the Holocaust Museum, there's an alcove that's really special. And it has a bunch of correspondence in it where the rabbis in the United States were asking the War Department in Washington if they would bomb um, the death camps in Germany and Poland and so forth on, on, the, on the bombing runs they were making, 1944. And um, the War Department was not responding to these letters. And, and after several letters from the rabbinical organizations in the US, they did answer. And they said, we are reluctant to bomb Auschwitz and the like, because we feel that it would make Herr Hitler, I'm quoting, we feel it would make Herr Hitler angry. My goodness, you make a monster angry, what happens then? He's already a monster. Um, and so- Well, I, I think that's a great point, Jay. Um, and the great point of it is how, how bad does this get from what we just saw this weekend? I mean, I'm, you know, they said, well, we, we, the next step would be if, if Putin used uh, biological or chemical warfare. How is this any worse than biological or chemical warfare? In, fa in fact, I think this is uh, the brutality of what we saw this weekend is probably worse than what uh, chemical warfare would possibly do. Um, hasn't Putin struck fear into the the governments of Europe and the United States and basically holding the world hostage? Yes, it's out of a bad movie, you know? And I think the, the proper end for this movie is you say, damn it, you can't do that anymore. You can't do genocide right in front of our faces. We are not gonna permit it. And if you do it one more day, one more day, one more life, we are coming in for you. And if that means war, then so be it. Um, I don't understand why we don't have the moral fiber to say that and do that. We cannot, he's making war on the whole world. We, we cannot let him do that. Well, it's moral fiber, it, it's not moral fiber, it's, it's timidity of, of economic uh, repercussions. I mean, we could shut down Russia and Putin in a heartbeat if Europe and the rest of the world would just agree not to buy his gas and oil products, period. Maybe. Okay. You know, everything we've threatened so far, everything we've done, it hasn't stopped him. He's killing thousands of people. We don't know how many people he's killing. And why? There is no reason. Because he can. Because he can get away with it. Because he can. That's the answer, Jay. Because he can. Uh, Cynthia, um, President Zelensky made an impassionate plea to the United Nations yesterday. And he was quite poignant to say, if you can't, and I'll paraphrase, if you can't kick Russia out of the UN uh, for what we just witnessed in Bucha and other cities, we're starting to see it, uh, what good is the United Nations? What is the function of the United Nations if one of your voting members is, is guilty of perpetrating these war crimes and, and, and war crimes against humanity? Uh, does Zelensky have a point in that? What good is the United Nations at this, at this juncture? I saw that speech and I, I agree with him. What, what is the point? And I, I thought the same thing back when they voted and the Russian was able to vote and the whole thing, you know, the, the uh, proposal, this was at the very beginning of this invasion. And I think it's important we stop calling it a war. Because a war, you know, suggests that there is some wrongdoing on one side or the other. This is just a straight up invasion from Russia 
into Ukraine. And I think that's an important, you know. It's I, beyond that. It's, it's murder. It's absolutely. I, I think I'll go murder all those people. That's what he's doing. Um, you I mean, know, it's, it's as low as you can go. It's absolutely I, madness. I, and I, uh, I, I would go question to both further you then. than war. I agree with you. But I would also go further than invasion. It's murder. Yeah. And I'm soon to probably be defined as genocide. We're probably heading down that road. Genocide. We've already headed down that. We are doing, he is doing that right now. Yeah. Well, we know uh, that Putin wants to be like Stalin, right? And Stalin used to say all the time, death solves all problems. No man, no problem. And so maybe he's just trying to follow right after, and, and we already know he is trying to follow right after Stalin and take back all of the Soviet Union and put it back together again. And that's you know, I, I think you're right, Cynthia. Um, I think in implementation, he's like Stalin. But as far as hopes and dreams, he's more like Catherine the Great. Uh, <laughs> he has these great dreams of, of the, you know, the 17th century of Russia and um, how Ukraine should be part of Russia. And uh, he is, you know, like a child with a tantrum, upset that they broke away uh, back in the, in the 90s. Right. Let me I ask you this. You. Is the United Nations... Is it outdated? Is its charter outdated, uh, given the times that we're seeing right now? I mean, United Nations came about just after you know the war, and certainly we had fresh in our mind uh, the camps of Auschwitz, uh, you know, all of the the death camps in Germany and Poland and around Europe. Um, is it outdated though? Uh, that well, question is to both of you. Go ahead, Cynthia, you first. I'll say I think so. If they're not going to kick Russia out of it and not, or at least make them not take away their voting power, then yeah, it's useless. What good is it? I agree with Zelensky completely. What good is it if it's not going to hold these guys accountable? Why aren't we hauling all these people into The Hague right now for tribunals? That's what I think anyway. We well, have to Go get them first. Get but, him. Go yeah. get him and bring him out. That's Jay, how I feel. <laughs> to you, that question. I think Cynthia should go to Moscow and make his citizens arrest. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, no, I, you know, I, I totally agree. Uh, the United Nations for, has been declined in decline for years. And it's because there are essential flaws built into its charter. The Security Council, where you have uh, inhumane countries violate human rights all day long, and they're supposed to decide who's violating human rights. Give me a break. To have Russia and China on the Security Council, it's a fatal flaw. And it's, it's proving up right now. Um, so I think I think what's happened is the United Nations um, was um, it was it was a negotiated result after the war. Um, everybody felt that the winners, so to speak, the, the ones who were left standing after the war uh, should have special rights and privileges and, and, and voting options. And so and they and they have, but they have turned sour and they have they have uh, really pulled the rug out from under whatever moral uh, you know, direction the United Nations had. And right now, he's absolutely right. He's saying what we all should be saying. The United Nations is over. And furthermore, they, there's no way within the charter to amend the charter to change any of that. The flaw is fatal. The United Nations is over. So the big question is, what do you do? You can't throw Russia out of the Security Council. Um, or the, you know, the other special organizations it belongs to within the United Nations. And if you can't do you, that... They, they can't or they won't? You can't under the charter. Can a charter it, be amended? Yeah, but it would, I think it's the same thing. You have to have the vote of these special, special countries, Russia and China among them. Uh, All right. So, the, so the, pro so the problem is pretty serious because if you... If you can't use, if the United Nations cannot act, um, cannot solve this problem, and there's a lot of problems they have failed to solve. You know, uh, how about Rwanda? You know, the United Nations and the Blue Helmets, they left town. They left town so the genocide could proceed. What yeah. kind of uselessness is that? And that's just one example. There are many examples. And I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it's in the public mind, but the United Nations has no power. It's impotent. Uh, and so is the International Court of Criminal Justice impotent. Um, so well, that was my next question is, um, 
what's their next step and how fast does that need to happen? I, I understand that they can actually um, review the war crimes, analyze it and come up with an evaluation of whether or not Putin is guilty of war crimes relatively in a, ma a matter of a couple months. Do you think that will happen? No, uh, you, Cynthia, to you on that question. You said it. You said it, Tim. you got to have the defendant in front of you. Well, they don't need the defendant in front of them. They need the evidence in front of them. They need to evaluate it. So there has no, to be evaluation. No. But that my understanding is that the ICC can do this in a matter of a couple months. And the question is, Cynthia, to you, will they? Why is it going to take a couple months? We've been watching this stuff for a month already. Why academics? I mean, I love them, but they want to sit around and talk all the time. Get straight to the point. You don't have to do some deep dive investigation. Turn on the television and you can see everything you need to know. I watched an interview of um, a Ukrainian resident who told the story of being in a crowd at a, waiting for food at a grocery store in a line like, and they came up and they randomly shot people in the head, just walked up and shot them in the head or pulled them out of the line and pulled their, had them pull their sweater off and pull their shirt over their head, which I don't understand what that point was, and then shoot them in front of all these people. And then the soldiers turned to the other people that they didn't shoot and said to them, they were Nazis. We're just trying to protect you. See there, we protected you. So this crazy disinformation campaign that we look at um, and we think it's just going out to the Russians in, in Russia, you know, but it is so much more pervasive and invasive than that. And I don't think we, re I didn't realize it until I heard this woman talk. And when the soldier turned and said that to them, I, 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 I was in shock for, I don't even know how long. I, I didn't even hear anything else on the TV for a while because I was trying to process what she was saying about and what it says about misinformation. Okay, thank you. You have a uh, question, Jay, Tim. We yeah, have a yeah. question. We have a question from uh, one of our esteemed colleagues, uh, Mr. Despang, and he's put it like this. Um, this is, as you said, Jay, this is a, a reminder of what the Holocaust looked like. And from, um, from a German perspective, it, it does, um, that the Allied forces basically came in and they had to end it. The United States had to end the Holocaust. They had to go in there and stop it. And uh, you accurately read the reply from the War Department, which before they did that, they were timid, they were intimidated. They were worried about Herr Hitler's being more angry than he already was. The question is, are we allied enough or too fragmented due to self-interest to be unallied? The answer is yes. We're not allied enough and we're too fragmented. I mean, this is so outrageous that the world has the power ultimately to stop it, but it is not stopping it. And, and ask me how I can show that. Well, it's not stopped. It still goes on every day. We watch it every day. Cynthia's point is well taken. The evidence is on the screen. It's on millions and millions and millions of screens around the world. And it's really pathetic that uh, the Russian foreign minister would get up and say, no, 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 it's all fake. All these people died, they were actors, it's fake. Um, I mean, it's just completely outrageous. And it's my view is this, a, as I said before, this is a war on all of us and every country. And we, the United States, uh, you know, the city on the hill, we cannot tolerate this. Western Europe cannot tolerate it. And yet, we tolerate it. We tolerate it, yes. Uh, to that point Jay just mentioned, uh, Cynthia, uh, the evidence. Uh, again, you, you heard from Lavrov, you heard from, from many people in Russia, the, the diplomats, uh, saying that these are actors. Uh, one thing that they couldn't explain away was the satellite images of those bodies laying in the street in the exact position as early as March 15th. And as you know, um, uh, the Ukraine forces just got into Bucha this weekend. And those, those images from the satellite matched up perfectly to the position of the bodies they saw this weekend. Uh, so Russia really can't explain that away, not accurately. And when does the world stop saying enough's enough with the um, 
should I say dif disinformation or uh, BS? But uh, your point's well taken, Cynthia, is that why does it take months for the ICC to um, get off their rear and do something? Uh, what else do you think can be done if the ICC does not act and the United Nations is a paper tiger? Um, do we go to um, Mr. Despain's point that, and, and Jay's point is just go in there, stop it. Well, you know, that's what I think, too. I completely agree with Mr. Despang and Jay Fidel completely. Because, and if they want to send me, I'll go. Like Jay said, it's going to send me in there to get him. <laughs> but no, I can't do it. But there's plenty of people that can. And I think that we need to not be afraid. And I, I said this in the last couple of shows that we've had about sort of about this whole thing that's going on in Ukraine, is that how is it possible that we're all, and I'll, I'll use the term again, <laughs> pussyfooting around, you know, Putin, as if we can't stop his nukes, we can, as if we can't go in there and get this done before he has a chance to do anything anyway. Um, and so what we're supposed to say, and this is the question I always ask, what, how is it possible that it's okay for us to sacrifice the Ukraines so that we won't get bombed? How is, I don't get that, I can't. Isn't that the nature of all proxy wars? Yeah, exactly. And I don't, I don't, I can't live with that. And I know there's a lot of people in America that can't live with it. But one of the biggest problems is if you turn on Fox TV for even five minutes, the problem is completely Biden's. He's the one who got us into this mess or got the Ukraines into this mess. They talk about Putin being this great guy. How can you blame him? It's his country anyway. All these just Russian talking points nonstop the whole time. And I mean, I try to tune in, but I can't take it for very long because I can only listen to these lies and this disinformation, misinformation that's not just coming out of Russia. It's coming out of our own American networks. And until we do something about that, boy, we're in big trouble. You know, where did old uh, Rupert Murdoch come from anyway? You know, um, yeah. so I don't know. I think that's our biggest problem is misinformation right here in America. Okay. Uh, Jay, I think I know the answer to this question. But I'm gonna answer it, or ask it anyway. Uh, today we saw President Biden at a union rally uh, and he mentioned yet again, tough sanctions. And I'll go down the list of what those sanctions are. Number one is that uh, he's gonna freeze now the major banks like Spar Bank and um, Alpha Bank, oh. the two big Russian banks and, and stop all transactions whatsoever. Two is that um, he's gonna ban all new investments into Russia and that includes personnel and talent. Uh, number three is he's gonna freeze all US bank assets here that uh, the debt payments from Russia cannot be paid. And last but not least, his two children, his two daughters, they'll be, uh, their assets will be seized if they're in the United States, along with uh, Lavrov and, and a few other people of the Security Council. Um, I guess the question is, wasn't that done initially uh, like weeks ago? And, and why is this now some uh, cataclysmic uh, sanction that now is going to stop Putin from uh, more uh, buchas. We were timid a, a few weeks ago. You could argue that he was holding stuff up his sleeve. He did say that he was, you know, if they kept on doing it, he was he was going to take more draconian steps. And I I suppose these are the steps. But one thing is clear. I mean, it's 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 just Aristotelian logic. We know that it didn't affect Putin. He's still in there. He's still doing it every day. He's still blowing people up and killing them on the street in the most brutal fashion and for the world to see. And so the sanctions, you can quote me on this, you guys, haven't worked. They haven't worked. However, they have affected the Russian economy and the world economy. They haven't worked. And these, I, I don't have a lot of confidence that these will work either. So it's, it's not like well, um, the frog boiling. Uh, slowly, you have to boil the frog right away. You have to take, you know, the strongest steps you can 
to make it clear that we we have some some will. Well, it's a point is the um, the ruble. Remember, it crashed horribly uh, during the announcement of the initial sanctions. The ruble's back up, and be, why is that? Uh, um, demanded that his oil and gas products from Europe be paid in ruble. That propped up the ruble. Uh, so he just walked around the whole intent of sanctions by uh, extorting Europe and, and other nations that uh, if you want my gas and oil, you'll pay me in ruble. So I, my question is this, um, I'll get off the editorial part of it. Uh, the question is this, if, if, if the war crimes we've saw and have seen in Bucha, what possibly can the world do if he starts to use chemical weapons or biological weapons? Uh, what, what other um, parts of Putin's family will be sanctioned and say, please don't do that again? Jay, to you. Mm. What, will the, what will the world do if, if Putin goes to chemical warfare or biological warfare? What will the world do or what will the world want, should do? Um, the, the answer about the first question, what will the world do? Probably not enough. He'll have his way. He'll, he'll murder a lot of people. It'll be genocide, um, and and we'll and we'll tighten the sanctions maybe, and we'll have some more discussions in the general assembly, um, but it won't stop him. Um, so that's what the world will actually do. What the world should do is get its act together, and the United Nations has to you know follow through, and and NATO has to follow through, and the U.S. has to follow through. You can't kill people in our face this way. You can't do it. We're not going to let you do it. We're going to come in. We have to come in because it's already clear. Is it not? It's already clear that short of that, he's not listening and he won't listen. No, and I don't know. I mean, I, so, OK, it's not a good thing to have a nuclear war. No, it's not a good thing to have him attack the U.S. No, or Western Europe. No, but, but the, this is a moral question. Are we going to let one actor do this, take over the land? I mean, this is like making World War the, the winning of World War II irrelevant. This is what it was about. You can't take your neighbor's property. You can't attack people and kill them by the million. You can't do that. We're not going to let you do that. Never again happening. So we have okay. to stop it from happening. Cynthia, to you with the same question. Uh, if what we're seeing in Bucha and other, other towns and villages and, and cities um, as Russia has retreated and we're finding all these crimes, crimes against humanity. Uh, what does the world do or should do uh, if Putin uses biological or chemical weapons? Well, I'm with Jay, they should go in and stop them, but I don't think they should wait until then. I think they should go do it now. I know that we're all sick of war. I know nobody wants to go to war, but it seems so wrong that our security is going to depend on the death of a nation. A whole nation of people are going to die because we don't want to go to war. Yeah, but, but Cynthia, because well, they die doesn't mean we're more, more secure. If yeah. they die, we're probably less secure. Exactly. Thank you very much for adding that, Jay, because that's kind of okay. Where well, let me. I, I mean, this is the obvious to me. Um, there is an alternative far less than a, a potential world war, and that is convince Europe your economy may have to take a real bludgeon hit, but stop buying gas and oil from Russia. I mean, isn't that more palatable than the potential um, exchange of nuclear weapons um, in a war that can't be won? Uh, isn't, isn't just the fact that an economic blockade of all gas and oil products should be the next step? Definitely should be. That should be now. That should have already happened in my mind. That, we don't need to wait for chemical weapons for that to be you know, implemented. I think that should already be right now. But I think hasn't Biden already been trying to appeal to these people to stop getting the oil? They they kind of slowed down and they cut back. Well, China is buying yeah. oil from Putin. India is buying oil from Putin. India and China. Half All right. Africa Perfect. What what sanctions Putin. or what economic um, 
warning should we send to both India and China for this, this breach of uh, economic blockade and uh, the fact they're not willing to acknowledge that there is war crimes taking place? What should, why should consumers still be happily buying from China and India? Are you asking me? I'll, I'll I'm going to ask both I... of you that question. Uh, Cynthia, to you. You answer first, Jay. You go ahead, Jay. You... Well, I mean, logically, what, what, what should happen is uh, Biden says, well, I'm going to put sanctions on you guys. If you buy oil, I'm going to put sanctions on you. And then we have the whole world divided into two economic and beyond that, two mm, clearly defined camps. Do you like Russia or not? It already is going that way, you know. And, and also, I want to add this, uh, and I'll, I'll leave you plenty of room, Cynthia. Um, we already decided this is a hybrid war. We already decided it's not just the shooting and the missiles uh, and the murder. I mean, the physical murder, the kinetic murder. Um, it's everything and anything. Yesterday, there was a report that the Russian um, cyber hackers had hacked into Zelensky's system and included a message on Zelensky's, um, you know, operational mm, website um, to the effect that he had surrendered. He had surrendered. This came from Russia. This came from Putin. This is just another weapon in the hybrid war, a non-kinetic weapon. And, and when you say that, when you conclude that we're in a hybrid war and everything, everything is on the table, including misinformation and uh, propaganda and false threats and hacking and everything is on the table. Um, and, and this war has to be looked, we have to look at it that way. We are in a third world war. It is a hybrid war and it's not just shooting at each other. Okay, uh, Cynthia, we've run out of time, but I'd like to hear your, your response. Um, I agree with Jay. And I have a quote I'd like to say since we're over time anyway, instead of telling my opinion, I'd rather share some very wise words from a few people, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, I have one that's from uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, and it says, we are all here defending our independence, our country, and it will stay that way. Glory to the men and women defending us. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. Plato said, only the dead have seen the end of war. Whew. Boy, did he know what he was talking about. Ernest Hemingway said, never think that war, no matter how necessary, nor how justified, is not a crime. Howard Zinn, who is a historian, said, there is no flag large enough to cover the shame of killing innocent people. Whew, okay, so now my final thing, and this will be my last word even, okay. It's a quote from the Pope. The tragedy of war taking place in the heart of Europe has left us stunned. Once more, humanity is threatened by a perverse abuse of power and partisan interests, which condemns defenseless, defenseless people to suffer every form of brutal violence. The Pope told the Catholic Church conference this, that faced with the brutality and barbarity of killing of children, of innocents and unarmed civilians, no strategic reasons can hold up. The only thing to do is stop this unacceptable armed aggression before it reduces cities into cemeteries. In the name of God, I ask you, stop this massacre. And this is what the Pope said on March 23rd. No March. All right. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Jay, you get the last word. March 23rd was two weeks ago. That didn't work either. No. Nothing so far has worked, and Vladimir Putin is determined to keep going and mm -hmm. using every weapon, kinetic and otherwise, at his disposal. We have to find a way to stop him. All right. I want to thank our, host, our, our guest, Jay Fidel, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for What Now America? And I'll ask that question again, What Now America? Join us next week, Wednesday, 11 o'clock. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.